So the title of the message is Why Christmas? Um, why do we celebrate Christmas? Is it a pagan holiday? Does the Bible say anything about this day? Am I required to celebrate it? Am I forbidden to celebrate it? Hopefully we will all come away with a greater understanding of why Christmas. Now, above everything else that Christmas has become, such as giving gifts, racking up debt, eating too many goodies that your daughter brings for Christmas, watching numerous Christmas movies and TV specials, and what's the deal with the chubby guys wearing red suits, acting all jolly. Way above all that is the fact of the incarnation, where God himself came from heaven to earth. He took on a human body. And why did God do that? Well, there's two main reasons. Number one is God came from heaven to earth in the form of Jesus to reveal to us the heart of God the Father. As most people want to know, if there is a God, what is he like? You know, how can I know him? In fact, this is what all the, the different religions have tried to answer to one degree or another. And most of the religions of the world believe Jesus of Nazareth came. Uh, most secular historians believe Jesus was here on earth. But unfortunately, most of them have differing opinions on who he is and why he came. Some teach that Jesus was a very good religious person. Others say that he was just one of many prophets and some will say, oh, he's like Abraham, he's in the line of Moses, uh, Isaiah the prophet, Buddha. Some will say Mohammed. Uh, others believe Jesus was a created angel. Some say he's the spirit brother of Lucifer. But the truth of the matter is, ever since sin entered into this world because of Adam and Eve's rebellion against God, our understanding of God has been distorted. It's been made corrupt. And so the number one reason God took on human flesh was so that Jesus could reveal the heart of God to all of us. In other words, for the first time since the fall of Adam and Eve in the garden, God himself would dwell among his people. People would be able to hear God speak, see God in action, touch him. That's what Jesus was all about. He did miracle after miracle. He opened blind eyes and deaf ears. He cast demons out of people. He cleansed lepers. I mean, he did amazing things. He even raised people from the dead. His name would be called, as we just sang, uh, and again, thank you to uh, the worship team. Did an awesome job this morning. Uh, you can pray for the Nordstrom clan. They're all suffering for the Lord down in Mexico, <laughs> laying on the beach at this time. A uh, great time for the whole family to get together. But, you know, I, I just praise the Lord. Krista did a great job and Angel and, and just having, you know, Paige and Trevor. Uh, thank you guys. It was good. But Jesus did all these things. And as we sang, he is Emmanuel. He is God with us. John chapter 1. We have a lot of verses to look at. John 1, starting in verse 1. This really speaks about this time of year. We read about Jesus. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. It says, He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. Uh, verse 14 says, And the Word, that's Jesus, became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and and truth. And so far beyond Jesus being just a good man, he was the God man. He was God come in human flesh. So everything Jesus said, everything he did while he was on earth was to represent God the Father to us perfectly. In fact, when the disciples, towards the end of his life, they were asking, well, one particular disciple said, show us the Father, Jesus, and that'll be sufficient for us. And in John chapter 14, verse 9, this is the response from Jesus. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? In other words, when you look at the Jesus of the Bible, not a bunch of different Jesuses that the world puts out there, but the Jesus of the Bible, then you get the clearest, best picture of, 
of who and what our Heavenly Father is all about. Jesus came to represent the Father perfectly. Hebrews 1 verse 3 says that Jesus is the express image of the Father. In other words, he is the exact representation of who God the Father is. That's the first main reason why Jesus came from heaven to earth, to reveal the Father to us. Now, the second main reason he came, um, and it's really most important for us, is that Jesus Christ left heaven, he came to earth, took on a body to reconcile sinners back to the Father, to redeem us from all of our sins. He would become the perfect sacrifice for the sins of the world because every one of us has sinned against God. We all deserve God's wrath and judgment, but Jesus came to redeem us or pay the price that we can never pay. The old saying is true. Jesus paid a debt that he did not owe because we owed a debt that we could not pay. You can't earn your way to heaven. You can't buy your way into heaven. Jesus paid the price in full. He took our place in death by becoming the perfect sacrifice for our sins. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21 says, For he made him, the Father made Jesus who knew no sin, because again, he was perfect, to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And then there's Romans 5, verses 8 and 9. It says, but God demonstrates his own love toward us, and while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. And God's wrath, again, that's what we all deserve. But Jesus took all of God's wrath upon himself when he went to the cross, and he died in our place. And so for no other reason than these, this is why Christmas is so important. This is why we should celebrate Christmas, the coming of God in human flesh. In fact, the incarnation is one of the most important days in human history. God took on a human body. He invaded planet Earth in the person of Jesus the Messiah. And most of the world still acknowledges this fact. In fact, your, your calendars are separated by B.C., before Christ, A.D., Anno Domini, which means basically after Christ. And so we have our calendar based on the coming of Jesus Christ from heaven to earth. On the other hand, and I understand why, a lot of Christians choose not to celebrate Christmas. Again, nobody knows the exact date. The Bible does not require us to celebrate Christmas, but it doesn't forbid us either. People will argue about the origins of Christmas. They'll say, you know, Santa Claus, he was a mythical character. Actually, St. Nick, St. Nicholas, was a real person. He was a bishop, and he did give money to those who were in need. But Christmas, you know, it's been hijacked. It's often been hijacked by this world and about materialism. By the way, did you hear the joke about the honest politician? And I haven't said it yet. You just you know where this is going, I guess. So the joke about the honest politician, the honest media person, and Santa Claus. The three of them are walking down the street together, and on the sidewalk was a $100 bill. Guess who got to keep the $100 bill? Santa Claus, because the others are mythical creatures. There. Got it. Now, when it comes to Christmas, people seem to have a love hate relationship with it. They're either all in or they are all out. But now when it comes to being a Christian, we want the Bible to be our guide. We want the Bible to speak for itself. God's word is true. In fact, the apostles in the early church did not celebrate Christmas on a specific day. There's no command from any book in the New Testament that we should celebrate this holiday. Now, even though they did not celebrate it, they sure did acknowledge the fact that God came in human flesh in the birth of Christ. In fact, the first two chapters of Matthew, we'll look at some of these verses later, and the first two chapters of Luke, they're dedicated to proving the fact that Jesus Christ is 
born of a virgin, born in Bethlehem, as the scriptures in the Old Testament said. Uh, the angel Gabriel told Joseph and Mary that his name would be called Jesus or Yeshua, God's salvation. Again, Emmanuel, God with us. He would save his people from their sins. The Apostle Paul gives us one of the greatest teachings about the coming of Christ and his purpose for coming. Look at these verses in Philippians 2, starting in verse 5. Paul writes, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, so he is God, did not consider it robbery to be equal to God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. Again, that took place at his birth. He came in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. And so, again, make no mistake about it. God took on human flesh, was born in Bethlehem, but he was born in order to die. Hebrews 2 tells us about the birth and the purpose of Christ's coming. Hebrews 2.14, Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself, speaking of Jesus, likewise shared in the same that took place at his birth. And here's the reason why. That through death he might destroy the power of death that is the devil and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. So he came to reveal the heart of God. He came to redeem us from our sins. Galatians 4, starting in verse 4, is another one. But when the fullness of the time had come, so at the exact right moment, that's what it refers to, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, we know her as Mary, born under the law, to redeem those, here's the reason why, who were under the law that we might receive adoption as sons. And so the Bible definitely teaches about the birth of Jesus. In fact, the early church even sang about the birth of Jesus. And it comes from something Paul wrote in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. They took this and they turned it into an early Christian hymn. It starts off saying, Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. And here's a song. I'll spare you the heartache of me trying to sing it. God was manifested in the flesh. That's his birth, right? He was justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up in glory. Now, we're not commanded to celebrate Christmas, but it's all there in the Bible. The angel Gabriel shows up. He speaks to Mary, tells her how she is going to be impregnated by the Holy Spirit. Mary and Joseph are obviously in the record. Uh, the shepherds in the field are going to see a great sign with the angel, and then the host of angels showing up. Uh, again, the virgin birth, the miraculous star that would lead the wise men to the baby. Well, now he's a toddler, Jesus. He's probably about a year old when they show up. So it's all there in the scriptures. It was predicted in the Old Testament. It was prophesied about in the New. Oh, it was prophesied about in the Old Testament. It was fulfilled in the New Testament. In fact, if you doubt the birth of Christ, then you have a lot more problems about Christmas than Santa Claus and flying reindeer. Seriously, the fact that Jesus of Nazareth was a real person is without controversy. So the big question a lot of Christians have is should we even celebrate Christmas since there is no biblical mandate or command to do so? I talked with someone last week. They were struggling with this very issue. But let me explain it like this. As you know, God gave the Jewish people seven feasts in the Old Testament that they were required to celebrate. In fact, when they got into Israel, three of those feasts became mandatory to celebrate in Jerusalem. So about 2,200 years ago, the Jews started celebrating a feast that is not in the Bible. It's not mandated by God. Uh, and it's one of the most celebrated festivals that every Jew uh, experiences and celebrates. In fact, we celebrated it with many Jews 10 days ago. Remember the holiday? Hanukkah. 
the Feast of Dedication or the Festival of Lights. That was started about 2,200 years ago, about 260 years after the Old Testament was completed, about 160 years or so before Jesus came on the scene, and yet it's one of the most celebrated feasts, even though it's not a biblical feast, but it's celebrated by Jewish people throughout the world. My point is there's a precedent that is established that it's perfectly okay to celebrate an important event even though the Bible does not require it or command it. Another would be the Feast of Purim. The Jews celebrate that. It's a joyous time. They remember what happened when Haman tried to annihilate all the Jews. This is during the time of Queen Esther. It wasn't a biblical feast. It wasn't required, but they've celebrated it for 2,500 years or so, celebrating the fact that the tables were turned on Haman and he went to the gallows that he wanted to destroy the Jews on. So I would say that this is true for followers of Christ as well. Every year we celebrate Resurrection Sunday. Some call it Easter because that was the very day, and we know it's the very day that Jesus rose from the dead which also coincides with the Jewish holiday. He died on Passover. He had to, Passover lamb, but he rose from the dead on the Feast of First Fruits. That first Sunday morning, Jesus conquered the grave. So quite frankly, I don't care that Easter has been hijacked by the world and it's celebrated with bunnies and Easter eggs and all these other trappings. For me, the resurrection of Christ is the most important event of all. For without it, this is what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 17. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile or worthless. You're still in your sins. And so even though there's no biblical commands to celebrate the birth or the resurrection of Jesus, the Bible gives us the freedom to do so. By the way, even though things were pretty quiet on the night of Jesus' birth, we know that, you know, they were looking for a place to have a baby because it was time. Mary's ready to pop, and they're banging on doors. Nobody would open a door. So they end up sleeping in a cave over in Bethlehem, a stable. It's where the animals would be kept. She gives birth. They lay Jesus, this little baby, in a manger, which is a feeding trough. So pretty quiet as far as that goes. But then you remember what happened. The angel of the Lord appears to the shepherds as they're keeping watch by the, over their sheep at night. And they start freaking out when this angel shows up. They're terrified. But look what it says in Luke 2, starting in verse 10. It says, Then the angel said to them, these shepherds, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You'll find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. That's quite the sign. You're going to find a baby wrapped up in these strips of cloth. He's lying in a feeding trough. Pretty unusual, even for that day. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, and this, this is a celebration, Glory to God in the highest, on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. So they might not have been celebrating so much that first Christmas morning, but all the hosts of heaven were celebrating this fact. So it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. So what a glorious celebration that was as the Savior of the world was born that first Christmas night. Now, if someone ever says to you, well, you know, Christmas is nothing more than a pagan holiday and people turn to the, you know, the festival of Saturnalia into Christmas, Saturnalia, it's the winter solstice, and pagans do worship their gods on Saturnalia. When did that take place? Three days ago. In fact, in Lincoln Park, they were celebrating the feast uh, or the winter solstice, Saturnalia. They were taking oranges and sticking clothes in them and doing some goofy stuff. Whatever. That was three days ago. 
That's not Christmas. By the way, do we know when Jesus was born? No. But we have a 130, uh, no, we have a 365 to 1 chance that he was born on the 30, 25th of December. So be that as it may, the day that it happened, happened. Whether it was December 25th or whatever day. But the winter solstice, what is that all about? It just commemorates the shortest day of the year. It's when the sun rises the latest and sets the earliest. It's the shortest day of the year. So I think winter solstice is great because that means now, from this point on, every day we get a few more minutes of sunlight. So that's what it's all about. The bottom line is every holiday can become a pagan holiday if you remove God and Jesus from it. You can have a pagan holiday, but a lot of Christians, they'll get upset when they see a Christmas tree. They'll say, those are pagan idols. Is that true? If you bow down to your Christmas tree and worship it, it's true. <laughs> or, or your Christmas tree can simply be a pretty decoration. The verses they will use to try to say, oh, that Christmas tree is a pagan idol, it comes from Jeremiah chapter 10, starting in verse 3. Look at this in context. For the customs of the peoples are futile. Again, wasteful. For one cuts a tree from the forest. Oh, man. Yeah, we do that. We used to go up in the uncompagre and cut a tree. The work of the hands of the workmen. Take note of that. I'm not a craftsman when it comes to trees. I like to cut things down. That's a different story. Cut it with the axe. They decorate it with silver and gold. They fasten it with nails and hammers. Oh, no, this sounds troubling. So that it will not topple. They are upright like a palm tree. But notice, and they cannot speak. They must be carried because they cannot go by themselves. Do not be afraid of them. Speaking of the tree, literally it's a trunk. For they cannot do evil, nor can they do any good. Now, in context, Jeremiah is receiving the word of the Lord, and it's all about creating an idol and worshiping idols. I encourage you to write them down, Isaiah 44, Psalm 115, because it talks about the exact same thing, but it goes into greater detail. In other words, the pagan, they'd go out into the forest, they'd cut down a tree, they'd strip all the branches off of it, and then they would cut it into three pieces. In Isaiah, and also in Psalm 115, it says they would take the first piece, and they would heat their home with it. They'd take the second piece, and they would cook their meal with it. The third piece, they would carve into an idol and say, this is our God, worship it. That's not the Christmas tree. That was a pagan thing that they were doing. The bottom line says, or the bottom line is, God says that those who worship a piece of wood become just like that piece of wood. Dumb, deaf, and blind, and might I say with my granddaughter's presence, stupid. It's really stupid. It cannot do anything for you. It's just a chunk of wood. But as followers of Christ, we understand that idols are nothing. And we know that Jesus is everything. I don't think I've ever met a Christian that would bow down to the Christmas tree and say, oh, we got to worship this thing. I don't think I've ever met a non-believer that has ever said, we need to worship this thing. Isn't it so glorious? This is going to save us. No. Again, I believe we have freedom to celebrate Christmas because we truly believe Jesus came from heaven to earth 2,000 years ago, and he gave his life as a ransom for us all. By the way, what did Jesus die on? I hear cross. That's the obvious answer. But he's also, it says he died on a tree. That's right. 1 Peter 2.24 says, Who himself, speaking of Jesus, bore our sins in his own body on the tree. Is that a pagan symbol? No. That's what he died on, the cross, made out of two pieces of wood. We don't worship the cross, but we worship Jesus. He paid the price for our sins on the cross that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. The Apostle Paul sums it all up this way as it pertains to celebrating holidays or not celebrating them. Colossians 2.16 
Paul says, so let no one judge you in food or drink or regarding a festival, speaking of the seven feast days the Jews would celebrate, or a new moon or Sabbaths, which are a shadow of things to come. But the substance is of Christ. In other words, all these feast days, uh, even worshiping on the Sabbath, they were all shadows of things to come. The substance is Christ. All those things point to Jesus. He is a fulfillment of the feast days. Jesus is our Sabbath rest. Sabbath means rest. You were to rest on the Sabbath. In Hebrews 4, it tells us Jesus is our Sabbath. He is our rest. We rest every day in the finished work of Christ for our sins. So I'm not striving and struggling to earn favor with God or get on God's good side. I just rest in the finished work of Jesus who paid the price in full for my sins. So he redeemed us. He saved us. He gave us eternal life. To me, the greatest evidence of Jesus coming from heaven to earth 2,000 years ago is the fact that God's word prophesied about this hundreds and even thousands of years before Jesus came. In fact, 4,000 years before Christ, the Lord gave the first prophecy concerning the birth of the Messiah. In fact, this is the very first verse that speaks of the Messiah being conceived by a virgin, and he would bring forth uh, destruction to the enemy, Satan. It's found in Genesis 3.15. Look at this verse. This is when God is pronouncing his judgment upon Satan who just deceived, he deceived Adam and Eve into rebelling against God. God says, I will put enmity between you, that's Satan, and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. Notice, he shall bruise your head. Literally means crush your head. And you shall bruise his heel. In the Bible, seed always refers to offspring. In this case, the seed of the serpent, the offspring of the serpent, would be those who follow after Satan's lies. The offspring of the woman would be those who follow after the Lord. Now, since we have all descended from Adam and Eve, we have been born with a sin nature. So we are automatically members of the kingdom of darkness because we are all born in sin, conceived in sin, David said. And so now we come by faith to Christ and he forgives us of all of our sins. And guess what happens? We go from being members of the kingdom of darkness to being members of the kingdom of God. Paul says it like this in Colossians 1.13. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us, that means transferred us into the kingdom of the Son of His love, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. So that means we're no longer locked up by Satan. We're not in His kingdom, but now we are citizens of heaven. Notice also again in Genesis 3.15 that the seed of the woman is referred to as He. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise His heel. That word he, it's in the masculine personal pronoun in the singular. It simply means that it's speaking of a person. In this sense, it's speaking of the Messiah who would crush Satan's head. When did that happen? At the cross. When Jesus died on the cross. That's when Satan, who thought he had conquered Jesus by killing him on the cross. Nope, that's when Jesus defeated Satan by paying the price in full for all of our sins. Through his sacrificial death, his victorious resurrection from the dead, Jesus broke Satan's stranglehold upon the sinful people of this world. So now we know Genesis 3.15 is referring to the virgin conception and birth because of this phrase, the seed of the woman. In other words, women do not have seed. I hope you understand that. Basic Biology 101. Doesn't matter what the woke crowd says. Men don't get pregnant. Women don't have seed. Seed for conception always refers to the male. So keep the, to keep the Messiah from having a sin nature, he had to be conceived by the Holy Spirit in the virgin. That was the miraculous conception. That brings us to Isaiah 7.14. 
again prophesied 700 years before Christ. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, which means what? God with us. The virgin will conceive. And then in Isaiah 9, 6, we read this amazing prophecy. For unto us a child is born. That's our perspective. And you think, big deal. Children are born every day. But unto us a child is born. But look, look at the next phrase. Unto us a son was given. That's God's perspective. For God so loved the world, John 3, 16. He gave his only begotten son. That's a fulfillment of Isaiah 9, 6. A child was born, but a son was given by God. And why did God give us Jesus to redeem us? And then it says, And the government will be upon his shoulder. His name will be called Wonderful Counselor. Mighty God. Take note of that. Because some cults will say, See, he's just a mighty God. He's not almighty God. Be careful with that. Here's a verse to write down, Isaiah chapter nine, uh, 10, verses 20 and 21, where it says, The remnant of Israel will depend upon the Lord Yahweh, the Holy One of Israel, the mighty God, El Gibor, that's the name, mighty God. Same person, God Almighty, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. God himself took on a human body in Jesus. These are all titles for the Messiah. And don't forget, God the Father has highly exalted him, given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So, it'll be on the screen, but if you want, turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 1. We'll wrap it up here shortly, but let's start in Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. You're familiar with this. We'll just look at a few verses here and also in Luke chapter 2. But Matthew 1, 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, that means they were engaged. It's before they were legally married, but the betrothal period, it's like our engagement time, but in the Jewish culture, you were legally bound together. You could not have any sexual relation until the actual marriage ceremony was over and then you could consummate the the marriage but here they're in this engagement period called the betrothal period and so they were betrothed before they came together that should be obvious she was found with child of the holy spirit uh, joseph's thinking really mary you're gonna tell me you got pregnant and it's by the Holy Spirit. This is crazy. I mean, he did not believe her. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, a very honorable man, and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. Why is he wanting to put her away secretly? Because in that culture, at that time, if she is pregnant and they're not legally married, she could be stoned to death because she has committed sexual immorality. And so he's looking for a way because he's an honorable man. I need to put her away secretly. I don't want her stoned to death. I love her. That was his mindset. So it says in verse 20, But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. In, math, in Luke chapter 1 and 2, this is what we read about Mary as well. She has the Lord appear to her. This angel Gabriel appears to her and says, this is what's going to happen. The Holy Spirit's going to overshadow you. And she's like, oh, man, this is amazing. This is crazy. And then she probably communicated it to, to Joseph. And he's like, no, you got to come up with a better one than that. And so he says, don't be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit, verse 21, and she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Jesus, Yeshua, means God's salvation. So this was all done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, 
saying, again, this is Isaiah 7, 14, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son. They shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took to him his wife and did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son and he called his name Jesus. And later on in Matthew, we'll find out that they had, Joseph and Mary had at least six children together, four boys and at least two girls. And the boys were all named who they are. So she gave birth miraculously, conceived miraculously. Now look at Luke chapter 2. Jesus had been born, and then, as it was the Jewish custom, you would go to the temple, you would dedicate your firstborn son to the Lord, and you would offer up a sacrifice. Most of the time, they would offer up a lamb for the sacrifice, you know, dedicating your son to the Lord. This is on the eighth day. This is when the child would be circumcised. Well, Joseph and Mary, they are very, very poor. So what do they offer up? Two turtle doves, right? That was what the poor people would offer up. So as we look at chapter 2, they're going to the temple and they're off, they've just offered up the two turtle doves. We read this in verse 25. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. This old man named Simeon, he's waiting for, what's the consolation of Israel? It means he's waiting for Israel to be comforted, to have the Messiah show up. He's been waiting. They're under Roman oppression at this time. They were under Babylonian captivity. They were under Assyrian captivity. The Jews had it brutal back in these days, even today. But what's the consolation of Israel? It's described in Isaiah 25, verse 9. And it will be said in that day, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he will save us. This is what Simeon recognizes about the baby Jesus. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Again, his salvation, Yeshua. God's salvation. So back here in Luke, He's waiting for this. And then it says in verse 26, And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. So he came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, So here he's holding this eight-day-old baby Jesus Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation. Again, you'll call him Jesus. He'll save his people from their sins. Which you have prepared before the face of all peoples, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles. And so most of us in here can rejoice in that. And the glory of your people, Palestine, what now? Israel. It's always been Israel. God's established the nation of Israel. So this is for the glory of your people, Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel. There would be division when Jesus entered into his public ministry. Those that wanted to kill him, those that wanted to lift him up. And then he says, And for a sign which will be spoken against, yes, a sword will pierce through your own soul also. Speaking of Mary at the foot of the cross, I mean, can you imagine the pain she was under as Jesus, or only, you know, this miracle baby on the cross, 33 years old, dying. And she was, I mean, it must have pierced her own soul that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. What an amazing prophecy he gives to Joseph and Mary. Make no mistake about it, 
Why do we celebrate Christmas? Why Christmas? Because God loved us so very much. He saw our lost, hopeless condition, and he gave us his son. And for 33 years, Jesus was Emmanuel, God with us. He revealed God's love and grace and truth and his righteousness. For 33 years, he lived a perfect life. He fulfilled every aspect of God's law. And for about three and a half years, Jesus demonstrated the heart of God towards mankind. Again, he healed broken hearts. He healed broken lives. He set captives free. He delivered people from demonic bondage. He opened up blind eyes, deaf ears. He cleansed lepers. He healed the sick. He raised the dead. But also make no mistake about it, Jesus was born, he was given by the Father to die. That's the whole purpose of Christmas. That was the goal all along. That was the purpose all along. He came to be sacrificed for our sins. And the Bible is clear, we are all sinners. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. There is no one righteous, no, not one. One of my favorite verses that sums it all up, Romans 6.23. For the wages of sin is death. I worked pretty hard sinning before I got saved. So my wages, what I earned, was death. Even if you only worked a little bit at sinning, you deserve death. That's the wages of sin, is death. But, here's the good news, the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And only Jesus can fill that hole in your heart. Only He can satisfy a thirsty soul. Only He can fill you up overflowing with His truth, His peace, His joy. And without Jesus, no gift under any Christmas tree will ever satisfy. If you have an empty heart, you're not going to have it filled by what's under your tree. But the free gift of salvation that Jesus offers you is all you will ever need. Why Christmas? That's why. Let me wrap it up by saying, this is what Jesus says in Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone, so he's not just speaking to church there in Laodicea, but if anyone, any individual hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. So again, God offers you the greatest gift of all, eternal life with Jesus Christ. Christmas won't satisfy, but Jesus will. He came, he lived among us, he died for us, he rose from the dead. Oh, and by the way, he's coming back again. He's coming back for us. He's going to rapture his bride up to be with him in glory. It's going to be awesome. This also means that Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. He's here right now. He knows you better than you know yourself. And he also knows your hurts. He knows your struggles. He knows your sins. He knows your pain. And he wants you to know that he can remove guilt, shame, Whatever is eating away at your life, he wants to remove the sin as far as the east is from the west from your life. Whatever is weighing you down, he is the answer to whatever problem you face. He is the, the answer to all your questions. It's all found in Jesus. It's not found in church. It's not found in Calvary Chapel. It's certainly not found in religion. But it's coming to Jesus and entering into the most incredible relationship any person could ever experience. But you have to come to Jesus by faith. He won't force you to trust him for salvation. A day will come, and I quoted it earlier, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that he is the Lord. But unfortunately for most people, it's going to be too late. They will bow down before him at the great white throne. Right now, because God has created us, the sovereign God has created us with a free will. Think about that. And he told Adam and Eve in the garden, I've given you all these trees of the garden. You can freely eat from all of them except for this one. 
The day you eat of that one, you will surely die. Love requires choice. If there is no choice, there's no love. But God loved you so much, he sent Jesus. But you have to receive him by faith. You have to trust him, in him alone for salvation. And when you do, you'll quickly realize just how much God loves you, how he has paid the price for you, how he has adopted you into his family, that you are now a new creation in Christ. The old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. Merry Christmas.